Hey, Brian, real quick. McDuffie created Core, right? Okay. Okay, so we have people coming in. Um, I'm just waiting for it to show up on my phone so I know that everyone's in. Great. Um, so hello everyone, welcome to CNHED's um, February monthly meeting. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, CORE, which is the Council Office of Racial Equity, um, the new council office for DC Council. Um, this is a webinar and so you do not have your cameras on and you are all muted, but uh, you can ask questions using the chat and after um, Brian has his initial uh, presentation, um, we'll be taking questions from the audience as well as questions that are floating around in Steve's head. Um, so I will go ahead and hand it over to Steve. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm gonna wait a minute. I'm still seeing numbers coming in. I'm gonna pause just for a second until I see the numbers stop just to capture everyone. It takes usually a couple minutes when you have a large group to queue in. Still coming. So I think I am gonna get started. Welcome everybody um, to our monthly meeting. Uh, I'm really excited about the topic that we're going to be um, discussing today. Um, it's no uh, kind of hidden, uh, it's, no, it's, it's not a hidden issue that uh, everyone in our society right now is focusing on racial equity. It's, showing itself in so many ways uh, across our society, um, in our media, um, in our government, um, in philanthropy, at the community level. And today we're here to learn about um, the Council Office of Racial Equity, which Councilman McDuffie led the creation of um, this past year. And so we're going to hear today from the director of the office, uh, who is no stranger to CNHED in any way. Um, and, and so I'm really, um, I'm just really excited uh, about this. I, I think that um, I just wanna take a moment and really lift up Councilman McDuffie's vision and commitment uh, on the issue of racial equity, not just the creation of this office, um, but his creating of an equity fund. Um, he convened and shared the council's um, um, uh, advisory board on racial equity, which CNHED participated in. Um, and there are other things that he is doing. But I also say in, in, in his support of our DC Community Anchor Partnership, which is working with area universities and hospitals um, to shift more of their procurements to African-American businesses. But even more pointedly and maybe personally, Councilman McDuffie carries the banner of racial equity um, everywhere he goes. Uh, I almost on a weekly basis get some referral where Councilman McDuffie has bumped into a business, um, has uh, met with a, uh, a, a, a higher ed or health system leader or even utility company leader and has teed up connecting um, their efforts to our community anchor partnership efforts. And so um, it's not just through these extremely visible things that we see um, with uh, the creation of the core office of the racial equity fund. It's something that he carries around. But what we're here to talk about today is one of those very definitive um, platforms that he has created. So it's my pleasure and just how this is gonna go. We're gonna hear from our speaker. Uh, he's going to walk us through um, the office, um, what it's here to do, um, some of his vision around the work, and more, and then we're gonna encourage you as we always do uh, to put questions in the chat. We will be monitoring them and trying to get to them as many of, as I can. So it's my pleasure to introduce Brian McClure, who is um, a, a friend of CNHED. He's worked with CNHED uh, in a number of ways. Uh, he's also kind of crisscrossed our local government, um, spent most of his time uh, on the council side, but he also worked for a period of time at DSLBD. So Brian has served in several leadership capacities for Council Member Kenyon McDuffie in the Council's Committee on Business and Economic Development, 
There he helped lead the district's efforts to operationalize racial equity into the council's legislative process. He also provided innovative solutions to increase opportunities for the, for, for the district small and local businesses and particularly black and minority owned businesses. Uh, Brian received his BA um, from Hampton. Sorry, Brian, I'm a Morgan man. Um, and his PhD in US history, African-American history and Atlantic world history from the University of Memphis. Um, while he is not working for the council's office on racial equity, uh, Brian can be found roaming local bookstores, somewhere in a local archive, barbecuing or spending time with his wife and two children in their home in Ward 8. So please join me in welcoming Brian McClure, Director of the Council Office of Racial Equity. Brian? And thank you again for that great uh, introduction. And um, I'm excited to be here and uh, Holly and Raina and to the entire CNHED team, uh, thank you for, for having me. And as you know, this work has been underway for several years and it's taken place on many fronts um, of which CNHED has been a key partner. So thank you for, for your work. Um, for those of you who I may not have yet had the pleasure to meet, my name is Brian McClure and I'm the director of the Council Office of Racial Equity or CORE for short. Our mission uh, is to transform government and uh, Holly, you can go to the next slide. It's to transform government through embedding a racial equity lens into every part of the legislative and oversight process. So this means normalizing conversations about race, operationalizing new behaviors and policies, and organizing and investing around racial equity. We aim to heighten public consciousness to existing disparities specific to the District of Columbia and to then design tools to help members, community organizations, and the public identify and eliminate structural racism and racial injustice. And um, you can go into the next slide because uh, I think it's important that we talk about the great team that we've assembled uh, to help us fulfill this mission. And so even the slides that you're looking at right now, uh, the website that I know many of you have um, already had the chance to check out, everything was been completely designed in-house. And um, I was sharing earlier, even uh, the artwork that's depicted on the slides and throughout the website is lifting up uh, communities of color that are local here to the district. Um, and so at CORE, we believe uh, that when we are successful, race will no longer be a predictor of life outcomes or opportunities, but a place where all persons, especially communities of color, live, work, and thrive. And so why is this work necessary? Uh, why now? Since the founding of our country, government laws, policies, and practices have created a racial hierarchy and have used race to determine who benefits and who is burdened. And that's true even, and maybe especially uh, here in the District of Columbia. Unfortunately, the issue of race and racism has and continues to be a part of all aspects of social, economic, and political life. And the data bears this out. Um, in income inequality, where whites in the district have 81 times the wealth of black residents, or in small business participation, uh, where Steve, you know this, um, you are significantly less likely to have access to capital or to receive a contract or to even get a loan if you come from a community of color or even in health outcomes where we've seen most recently uh, that in part due to COVID, although life expectancy has dropped across the board, it's dropped three years for black Americans. And so this gets us to the how, and um, you can go into the next slide. At CORE, we take what we like to call the groundwater approach. Uh, and so bear with me for a second as I talk to you about how we are approaching systems change. What if you came outside your house one day uh, and you saw a fish floating up, uh, belly up dead in a pond? You probably stop and will say, man, what happened to that fish? Uh, maybe the fish ate too much. Maybe, you know, the water was bad. You know, maybe he didn't do what he was supposed to do. Maybe you didn't listen to his parents, all these implicit biases and things that will lead us to make certain assumptions. But what if you walked a little further and you saw a pond and then you saw that there were 50 fish floating belly up? You will probably stop and ask a slightly different set of questions. You may say, hmm, did someone poison this water? Um, you know, maybe uh, there is some contaminant or invasive species that has caused these fish 
to now be floating belly up in the water. But then what if you walked a little further and you came to the realization that every body of water uh, is, you are now seeing fish floating up dead. You will probably stop and say, there's something wrong with the water in this town. Now imagine all the water systems across the East Coast are poisoning all the fish die. There would be a national emergency and you would stop what you were doing to correct and address those problems. Well, when we talk about structural and institutional racism, we are talking about addressing the underlying systems and causes that are causing disparities and inequities uh, where we are seeing black and brown and communities of color uh, almost at the uh, wrong side of the spectrum on each of these, um, almost any relevant economic and social indicator. And to make this analogy a little more real, imagine then that fish is now a student. Now, you may say, well, who failed this student? Maybe the student didn't study for his or her exam. Maybe that student didn't have discipline. Um, or maybe that student had a bad teacher. But then what if an entire school is failing? Then what if a specific race of students constantly continue to fail? And so we see across this nation, even let's not even go to the nation, let's say here in DC, why is it that schools in Anacostia and Baloo are barely at 10% literacy rates? We would stop and call a national emergency. And so what we're saying is rather than examining the individual student, we must examine what is causing these systems where entire schools are failing our students. Um, and so this, if you can, we have a slide up that talks about how we began to examine and review these systems. Um, and part of that is the REACH Act. And so it creates uh, several different, what I believe are innovative approaches with the, across the district government. So it includes in part, uh, different provisions for the executive, as well as here in council. Um, and so the Council Office of Racial Equity uh, is tasked with um, several um, uh, functions, and I'll get to those in a second. Um, we believe in taking a multi-pronged approach. One uh, includes reviewing legislation and helping members and the public to think through and staff think through how to design racially equitable legislation. And this is what we mean when we start to talk about how to operationalize racial equity. Um, and you know, maybe a little later, I'll show you some of the toolkits that we've designed that begin to help us ask questions such as what is the data that's being collected? What is the goal of this particular policy? How are we engaging communities in real and consistent ways? Um, what about implementation of legislation? Are we going through the whole song and dance of passing legislation only to end up that it's not being funded? And what impact does that have specifically on communities of color? Um, the second piece that I think many of you are also familiar with is that our office uh, core is tasked with creating racial equity impact assessments. Um, and those are uh, statements that review permanent uh, policies that come through council in order to provide a very in-depth assessment uh, to allow uh, more accountability for who is burdened uh, and who benefits from legislation. And so I know that we are, um, you know, we want to spend as much time as we can getting to uh, Q&A, but I thought it was important uh, to talk about CORE's overall approach. Um, and so I've been talking a lot and I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation. And so I'll pause here uh, and looking forward to the conversation. So thanks again. Brian, thank you so much for that uh, overview. And clearly with the, the things that you all have put in place so early in your existence, show both some thoughtfulness as well as some comprehensiveness in how you plan to approach the work. Um, one question I have that I think we'll be interested to our members who also see themselves as prisms of racial equity work and engagement is, um, is, is how will the racial equity score uh, interact with the fiscal impact statements? Um, 
Are, are they going to have their own tracks of existence? Are they going to are they going to are they going to 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 kind of blend in in the analytics that they provide the council for decision making? How do you all see that? Yeah, thank you for that question. And so uh, in a similar fashion, and um, just to make sure uh, all of our listeners are aware. So when legislation moves through council, they require um, uh, now three things. Um, one, a legal sufficiency determination or a LSD, uh, a fiscal impact statement or what we call a FIS. And now it will require a RIA, a racial equity impact assessment. And so, uh, Every step of the way, uh, when I was working um, in a member's office, we always had to be mindful of, you know, asking at least those two questions, right? Is a measure legal? Uh, and then how much will it cost? Mm -hmm. So this is adding a third component, which is asking who will this impact? Um, and specifically, how will this impact communities of color? Um, in a similar way, the fiscal impact statements um, you know, we could pass a, a bill and it could cost a billion dollars, right? Um, it can still go through council. It would just be what, subject to appropriations. Um, in a similar way, the racial equity impact assessments are uh, here to one, hold members accountable to the public, uh, but will also help them to make more informed decisions uh, to understand uh, who's being impacted. Um, it asked them to think about who has been engaged. And so are we lifting up the voices of the most marginalized communities uh, in the District of Columbia? And so one of the things that CORE hopes to do is to spend a lot of time fine tuning our processes. Um, we've evaluated what many jurisdictions across the country are doing to take innovative approaches uh, to ensure that uh, community participation is, is front and center. So. Uh, so the scores, will that be done internally by your team or are you going to be using um, external expertise to help advise you as well? Yeah, so kind of a, a mixed approach um, on, you know, the basic answer is that we have uh, our four team members will be conducting and applying our methodology and framework uh, to conduct the RIAs and issue the, the RIAs. What we've seen in other jurisdictions that I think is a very innovative approach is that um, certain offices bring in community stakeholders and they have assembled these racial equity task force where they actually conduct these racial equity impact assessments in partnership with the community. And so although CORE will be primarily tasked with conducting them, one of our hopes and aspirations is that we are able to eventually bring in community stakeholders to help us conduct these. Um, I'll good. say, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 go ahead, finish. No, but, uh, but I'll say, you know, we are uh, broken down by uh, each staff covers specific committees. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you were to look on our website, you could see, uh, you know, we've tried to match our expertise uh, and focus and make it align with the council committees that we cover. Um, but we're also very happy that we, we have many partners to help us think through this, uh, whether it's CNHED, which is one of our official partners. That's right, uh, get us in there, get us in there. <laughs> the Urban <laughs> Institute, the Fiscal Policy Institute, uh, and, and many others um, that, that we're happy to partner with and help us think through this. So Adam Albanese, uh, Director of Workforce Development, uh, actually asked a really good question, and I just want to frame it before I, I ask it. One of the things that I'm, I will say I am personally learning, but I think all of us are learning in this new era of awareness, is that from the day slavery ended, systems were put in place to disenfranchise people of color whether it was voting or zoning and access to housing or lending and the access to capital or, I mean, it, 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 because we weren't taught this stuff in school and because history was taught, it, taught in a slanted way, we are just, we're having to retroactively learn so much of what was done to disparage and disenfranchise. And so Adam's question is, and first he says, this is amazing, but down the road, will there be an opportunity to conduct REIAs on existing policies as well? 
Yeah, so thank you for that question. And, um, you know, I'll answer that in two ways. One, or, or let me answer it directly first. Um, one of the things that we made sure were included in the council rules that governs um, decisions and processes for council is that uh, members would also be able to request uh, policy statements or analyses from our office. And so one of the um, staffers that we have uh, is actually a data and research analyst. Um, and so, you know, we have a very diverse team that will help us to be able to put out white papers, put out policy statements, help members in the public find access to, to the most relevant data and research. But members, council members can also ask us to review any specific question. Um, we, it's just a matter of how we prioritize it. And um, just to, to piggyback on the, the first half of, of your statement, um, one of the considerations that is always front and center is what is the historical trauma that individual communities have, have faced? Um, we think that's an essential question because you know most people talk about redlining or zoning policies, but there are myriad of policies that have been put in place uh, that have disenfranchised communities of color and that continue to disenfranchise communities of color. And so our role is to specifically lift those up and tailor yeah. our policies. I mean, I, I will confess that um, there is what I'm starting to call quarantine learning. You know, after looking at Star Wars for the 50th time, I started veering into other channels. <laughs> and in doing so, I, I, I've discovered that there was a nation within a nation whose prime purpose was to disadvantage and to control and in many ways to quarantine um, the advancement of people of color in this country. I didn't realize how sy systematic it was and how pervasive it was until you, you know, like I said, get off of Star Wars and get into some more, more of the documentary channels where you're learning, um, you're just learning our, we're relearning our history in new ways because of racial equity. Um, Cyril Crocker asked, if we have concerns about a specific piece of legislation and the impact it may have, who should we reach out to in your office? Yeah, and so Holly, if you can go back to the slide that had our, I think it has our contact information up there. Oh, it doesn't, but um, yeah, I mean, I'll make sure that uh, before this ends that I drop my contact information. If you go on the website though, uh, you'll be able to see each of our email addresses and you'll be able to see how to get in touch with us directly. You know, and I just wanna uh, emphasize in it, uh, Cyril, it's good to have you on here. Um, hope all is well, but it's important to us uh, that you know the we are informed by those who have lived experiences and by the communities uh, and organizations that are serving communities of color. So we want to make sure that we are taking very nuanced approaches. Um, so any information that you have, if you're looking to partner with us, we would love to to connect. Um, Evelyn Rodriguez makes a statement and then a question. She says, greetings. I hope everyone is well. I'm very happy with all the new training programs that are available to minority owned businesses. But I think that a missing piece to this equation is pairing the trainings with work. Training in a vacuum is, is useless. Um, this is the piece that I want to see uh, addressed now. How do we make the connection? I'd love to be uh, in part of the dialogue. So Brian, before you respond, um, Evelyn, I, I, would, I would ask you to reach out um, to uh, us at CNHED, um, in addition to our own DC Community Anchor Partnership, which is trying to get minority businesses, larger procurements through universities, health systems, and utility companies. Um, but it, 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 and we've been doing this work for the last couple of years, and we are focused, as Brian suggested, on system change. So we're working with, um, um, Right now, about seven or eight of our universities and hospitals, we're helping them re-engineer their system so they can be more accessible to minority-owned businesses here in DC. But there are others that we know of. So not just through our community anchor partnership, we know of, um, I won't say all, but I think we know of most of the other stood up efforts to help people. I think your point about going through training and learning about access to capital and all of this in the absence of actual new opportunity um, can be a little bit of a exercise in futility. There are a lot of people 
um, in our political system, led by Council Member McDuffie, um, and also at the community level and the institutional level that are sensitive to this. But Brian, do you want to you want to add to that? Yeah, um, that's that's one of the key approaches that CORE takes is to uh, take an intersectional approach. And what I mean by that is we need to understand what I call the first, second, third order effects. And so, you know, part of that starts, for example, with understanding wealth uh, inequality. And so it doesn't matter if we have all the training programs in the world, if we are not ensuring uh, economic stability. And so, and you know, that then in and of itself doesn't matter if we are approaching health equity or you know, if people don't have access to transportation to get to those trainings. Or if you know, in this COVID world that we're living in, if they don't have uh, digital connections uh, to participate in trainings that may be now online. And so we have to be able to take a comprehensive approach. Uh, and that's one of the things that ARIA's helped to lift up is to show members, uh, staff and the public, how these decisions cross over into other sectors. And that's especially true when we think about trainings and, and policies and solutions that we're designing. So next question is Pat McEnany, who asks, is, is, the, is, is one goal for the RIAs to develop specific metrics in each policy area, education, housing, or transportation? And I guess that the, the tail end of that question is, or is it more specific to, you know, pieces of legislation. So I think the question is, are you looking for equity in housing broadly? Are you looking for equity in education, transportation? And Patrick, if I'm not getting that framing right, type it in the chat and, and, and we'll re-ask it a different way. But Brian, do you have that? Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the things that you'll see up on our website is, uh, one of our partners is the DC Policy Center. And we worked with them to create a DC racial equity profile for economic outcomes. You know, none of this matters if the public and members don't understand what the existing inequities are and how they came to be. And so our goal is to elevate the consciousness of what these uh, disparities are. And it all revolves around metrics, right? And so one of the things that um, is also up on our website, we've developed um, an oversight toolkit. Um, and part of it is asking agencies, for example, what are the metrics that your agency collects? Is it disaggregated by race? Um, is it disaggregated um, by geography? Um, and so, you know, we would be able to look at a specific program within any government agency and see, you know, uh, how is this specific program yielding results or creating barriers specifically along racial lines? And so we've already, we've been very excited to see members already incorporating these questions uh, in, in their performance oversight hearings. But our hope is that we are able to uh, put up these inequities. And one of the things we're aiming towards that you will see hopefully by the summer is what we call a disparity tracker so that we can actually gauge to see how we are closing the gaps uh, on these different initiatives. So thank you for that question. So next, Martin Mellett from uh, Jubilee Housing asked, Using REI, using RIA, I'm going to start saying the short version because <laughs> I will trip over the, the, the letters. Uh, although when I have to say C and H E D, if I ain't tripping over those letters, I shouldn't be tripping over the other ones. If a law is neutral on race equity, what will that will that be acceptable? Or will each law need to show a positive racial uh, equitable outcome? Yeah, so one of the things one of the things that we like to say is that, you know there is always going to be some type of effect. Um, and so, of course there are caveats to that, right? Um, I think it may be helpful to look at, and I, I'll just say this for, for the sake of time, um, on our website, we have what we call the conclusions rubric. Um, what we always try to show and underscore is that there are more than likely something that should be considered. Um, and so although the conclusions may have these five different outcomes, which include will exacerbate racial inequity, has the potential to exacerbate racial inequity, has no immediate impact on racial equity, has the potential to advance racial equity or will advance racial equity. 
that is the five types of conclusions that we will arrive at. And then in the actual RIA statements themselves, we will expound on how we arrived at those conclusions and what exactly uh, they mean. Our goal is that, you know, members see this and think about, you know, what the potential impacts may be. Um, so it's, it's a lot more nuanced to that, but hopefully that starts to, to get at the, the question that, that was asked. Yeah, and Brian, so similar to the fiscal impact statements, oftentimes council members look at those and they use that as part of their decision making, whether to support a specific bill, piece of legislation, initiative, development project, or whatever. So you're envisioning that people will look at the REIs and they will, the RIAs, and they will, um, they will use that as one of their determinants, but in no way will it be a sole qualifier or disqualifier for a particular action. Is that correct? Right, that's true. And, you know, uh, we always talk about racial equity as both a process and an outcome. So on the process side, uh, one of the things that will benefit members and staff is the exercise of staff working in partnership with CORE to develop out these statements. And um, I think what would be helpful here, so a bill will be introduced, the hearing would be held, and then by rule, members have 10 days to inform us of a markup date. That's the date where a committee plans to hold their initial vote. Uh, at that point is where CORE will engage the uh, whatever committee is marking up the bill to begin the official process of reviewing and scoring that racial equity impact assessment. But there's a lot of conversations that are happening from the time a bill is introduced for us tracking it to the time a hearing is held to the time we officially start putting pen to, to paper. So I'm gonna pause for a real quick paid political announcement, actually unpaid political announcement. Um, Mustafa, uh, one of our allies in the work is inviting all the panelists um, tomorrow to um, the Ward 8 CD um, uh, planning process. Um, I will say that Mustafa, I have, I have been engaged with him in this journey, has spent at least the last two years, and Mustafa may correct me and say it's been longer, but really working with every grassroots connection uh, over in Ward 8 and around the city um, to stand up a really bottoms up a process. And so to find out more information, you can go to ward8cedplan.com. That's ward8cedplan.com. Um, it's the, the uh, address is in the chat. It's a very friendly user, um, friendly user, friendly registration uh, a system. Um, and that is going to be tomorrow morning. So please check out that information in the chat and I can see the questions are piling up. Let's keep going. What are the specific criteria of the racial impact assessment to be used for legislation? Is one criterion the percentage of project projected displacement based on percentages of displacement of black people as a result of other projects resulting from legislation? And that comes from uh, Renee, Bur Renee Bowser. Yeah, the, so Renee, thank you for that question. There is a, essentially a five part methodology that we take. And so it begins by, um, actually Holly, if you can go back to slide five, I believe, and it follows this essential approach. You know, How do we understand the intent and goal of the specific bill? Um, what does the data say about a specific um, a bill, what data is available or not available? Why isn't that data available? And what you'll see, if you go on our website, you'll see where we've conducted two uh, racial equity impact assessments already, but we try to bring out and illuminate those disparities for that specific policy issue. And so if it's a bill where we may see that there may be some type of displacement that occurs, uh, it, we will be able to try to raise up the specific communities that are affected and what the data says by those individual communities. Um, and of course, this goes without saying, it depends on what the specific bill is. Um, but then we also look at, uh, you know, who benefits, who's burdened, um, what is the historical causes, um, and is the proposed solution in proportion to uh, solving the problem that's being posed. We then go about 
um, evaluating the possible implementation scenarios to see, you know, how much will this bill potentially cost? Although that's the budget office that does that, you know, are there resources to implement it? Who would be tasked with implementing it? Um, and then what are the potential uh, forecasted implications of racial equity, whether positive or negative? And if there are recommendations, uh, we provide those to the members and staff and finalize it by summarizing our conclusions. And so, this so framework is, is on our website. Sylvester Bush asked a, a good question. Um, there are a lot of bills that are introduced, however, never make it out of committee. Do you believe that the RIA as a requirement will increase the number of bills that go nowhere? I don't know. Um, our goal is focused on making sure that the bills that do uh, aren't, you know, uh, harming communities of color. Okay. Um, Let me see real quick. Will CORE look at the likely impact of displacement on low-income Black working class? Um, I be city uh, community of OP's proposed up, up pluming of Crumble School to build market rate housing. So again, you know, I would just emphasize the general framework that we approach, and it depends on what bill is before us being reviewed at the time. Um, I will say that it is important that uh, our analysis does include a specific breakdown. And that's why we, we always talk about not just grouping in folks by calling them minorities. Because when you do that, uh, it, it does not respect the individual history and experiences that communities of color uh, have faced specific to DC and in the country. And so we always try to tailor the data specific to the communities that are being impacted. Um, and we try to uh, conduct our analysis to dig deeper uh, into whatever issue it may be. And so when, when you see the readers come out, you will see very detailed uh, and where possible disaggregated information. And that's why we are, as part of our trainings, making sure that members are working with executives to make sure that data is disaggregated by race and then by different socioeconomic indicators, by health indicators. Uh, and, and if I may, if I can give an example of what that may look like, um, it may look at, you know, what are the percentages of, you know, uh, small businesses that have applied for a specific loan? How many were accepted for this uh, loan? How many were denied? Um, how many started an application but didn't finish it? Um, you know, how many ultimate grants were dispersed uh, along racial lines? And so, you know, it, it just depends. But, and, and I know Renee is getting at the comprehensive plan and clearly I'm not answering that question, <laughs> but we'll, we'll love to, to, you know, if she can reach out to, to talk with her about it. Uh, Brian, not answering that question is why you will go far in life. Um, so Shana Arthur uh, uh, just writes, this is a fantastic program. Congratulations to the core team. Um, seeing Shana here. Shana is our director of procurement for Georgetown University. She is our um, our, our key contact at Georgetown University, working with us on the DC Community Anchor Partnership and working tirelessly to uh, address systems uh, change within Georgetown to make procurement opportunities for minority business. So big shout out to you, Shana. Glad you could join us for this program. And I just needed to lift you up because you're doing exactly the kind of work that CORE wants to prod within DC government Shane is leading that work inside Georgetown University. Um, next question is, how is it that proposals to redevelop public housing projects by failing to replace the number of housing units, uh, uh, units affordable to public housing residents, like what is happening with Hope 6 and can ever be considered racial equitable development, racially equitable development? And Brian, so I think that's a general question around um, public housing. I mean, it doesn't just apply to public housing, but we know public housing has a very sharpened lens around the issues of racial equity 
And I don't know if that's been part of your office's internal discussion so far, but I want to tee that up in the event that it has. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you'll be saying some things coming out of the office specifically around housing outcomes. Um, and, you know, there's a lot to be said about it, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to, to get too far ahead of myself, but it is something that our office is very focused on. Um, and another great colleague of mine, Dr. Marla Dean, who runs Bright Beginnings, um, uh, um, a family center, uh, asked how will CORE interface with, DC, with the DC Research and Practice Partnership or will it? Yeah, so our hope is to establish relationships with as many uh, and as many diverse types of community-based organizations as possible. So I'd love to connect and um, I'll make sure again before this ends uh, that everyone has access to uh, reaching out to us uh, because we will only be successful to the extent that we're able to partner with uh, community organizations. Yeah, um, I, Brian, I will make sure that I connect you and Dr. Dean. Uh, I serve on the Bright Beginnings board. Uh, Dr. Dean is doing, and her team is doing a fabulous job of working with uh, vulnerable families throughout the district. Um, do you use cons do you use consistently identified metrics to determine whether a project is racially equitable? Yes, and I see <laughs> that's another question from Renee. Renee, you just need to reach out to our office so we can talk. Okay. Um, what gaps in available racial equity data stick out as you um, as you begin to 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 fill versus difficult being easy to fill versus that's a really great question um, because I think so many people are grabbing at information and, and it's almost like in some ways the veil around data has come down and now not only is new data being created but new data is being sought. And everyone is searching for how to configure data with policy and advocacy and other things that we're doing. Um, but what's your response to that? Yeah, like we have to think extremely creatively about how we are collecting data, um, who's collecting it, <laughs> uh, and what, what narrative, what story that data um, says. And so that's why if, when you look on our website, you'll see an entire section dedicated to data and research. One of the examples that I'll give um, about how we should start thinking creatively about data collection and what story it tells um, is in tax policy. And so in many ways, tax policy is race neutral. Um, but what ends up happening with these race neutral policies, uh, we see that it does not benefit uh, black and brown communities. And so even how you know, the IRS collects data um, by, by households, by incomes, um, it's not always broken out by race. And at times, it disadvantages communities of color. I'll take that a step further. You know, CNHED does a lot of work uh, with small businesses, right? And um, dealing with uh, small business participation um, in the district. And so across the nation, most states and jurisdictions have minority business uh, enterprise programs. The district does not. Um, and part of that is a lot of the data that the district collects um, is only self-reported data. And so one of the things that, you know, I spent a lot of work on it and, and to the executive's credit, they have done, they've got, taken leaps and bounds to improve how the data is collected and identifying what data is not there, such as, uh, you know, the percent of uh, black residents that have started a business, the percent of business, black owned businesses that have closed the percent of businesses that have received contracts and so on and so on. Um, but yeah, that, that's a very important question that we are working with um, our many partners, um, whether it's Urban or Georgetown or MITRE, uh, to be able to better assess and collect this data. So speaking of data, um, Councilman McDuffie has um, continually championed um, uh, a disparity study for the District of Columbia. Uh, and you've been involved with that effort from its inception as well. And the administration is, is, is very seriously taking on the role of implementing the, the study that the council member commissioned last year. How do you envision the disparity study uh, informing your work 
um, or, or is that yet to be determined? I think largely it is yet to be determined. But those are the types of initiatives that our office hopes to continue to uh, shed light on and um, sort of work as advisors as it's further implemented. Uh, you know, I was having a conversation yesterday uh, about the disparity study. Now that is um, currently with the executive, but our focus largely is on identifying these disparities and helping members to identify um, areas where they should be focusing their, their efforts. But, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time, you know, <laughs> reading through those Supreme Court cases and writing these policies. So it's something that is, is always going to be with me. So, you know, I, I'm going to be <laughs> following that, that closely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all of us who um, understand uh, targeting uh, as an issue, uh, and, and, and know even a little bit about the, the legal boundaries and barriers uh, and the importance, therefore, of a disparity study, you know, are waiting in the wings with the hopes that it will give the district broader license to do some things that we know needs to be done. And I'm just imagining that if the disparity study meets the legal thresholds that I know the council member has worked so hard in the design of the study to do and the administration is, is seriously uh, trying to enact along that, that design that the study will become uh, both platform and license to be more intentional and even more specific. Um, our own Yvette Banfield asked, what role exists for the community to support, to, to help further CORE's mission? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the most immediate ways is as we, I uh, get into, you know, in earnest conducting these racial equity impact assessments. We want to make sure that we are raising the voices of those that are most impacted by this. Um, we believe that this process belongs to the community. Um, and so we want to be able to make sure that we understand the nuances, understand the data. We may not always catch all the, the data points. Um, you all may be uh, and, and often are subject matter experts in your specific areas. Um, and so I think there's an immediate opportunity as we are going through these RIAs to be able to work with you so that we are one, making sure your voices are heard, but also helping us as we are thinking through uh, our assessments um, as well. But then also, um, you know, we want to make sure that we are, uh, you know, maybe I think this was maybe two weeks ago now, we uh, conducted our first uh, core training institute uh, for staff, for council staff. And so that is also something that we are able to work with uh, community-based organizations and helping them to think through how to even have conversations about race, setting common definitions of what racial equity is. Um, you know, even one of the toolkits that we've designed, uh, it, although it's specifically centered around designing racially equitable legislation, can be adapted to meet the needs of whether it's the ANC, uh, local boards, or uh, faith-based institutions, it can be adapted to address the specific needs of the community. So that's something that, that we're hoping to, to work with our community partners on. Um, this is, a, this is a, uh, I think, an important question. Um, Jean Madison asks, how are you connecting with immigrant groups in DC, Ethiopian, Salvadorian, et cetera, how do you take the history they come from, their experiences in the states and DC to look at disparity and discrimination from their lens? Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things that is essential to this office. And, you know, I try not to get into discussions of, you know, people say, um, you know, whose oppression was the worst? The point is that racism affects communities differently. Um, and each specific community has a relation in um, a hit unique history in relation to white supremacy. So part of our, uh, the role of CORE is to illuminate what those uh, histories are and if and when they created uh, inequities. And then how do we design uh, proposals to move the needle on them? And so we've already, for example, been having conversations uh, with members from um, the Ethiopian communities, um, Ethiopian business owners, 
um, folks from um, the Asian and uh, Pacific Islanders communities, which have their own uh, individual histories, but often end up being grouped in as just Asian. And so there is a lot of work, and I, I'm 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 grateful that you know that question was asked because it is important to who CORE is, and even to how um, members have to begin thinking much more comprehensively uh, about how we're addressing uh, ethnicity and culture as well. Um, Keisha from Douglas Community Land Trust says, would love to help welcome CORE into the community. Um, uh, uh, Brian, we uh, partner with Douglas uh, Community Land Trust. Um, uh, our former um, uh, uh, development and communications person left us to go uh, help stand that up. And uh, it is a, it is an equity model that is emerging in DC, in particular, east of the river. I'll make sure that you get connected. Um, and let's see, I don't think I have any more questions in queue. I'm checking time. We have a few minutes. Um, how do you think CORE will affect this year's budget process? <laughs> so we've already been affecting the budget process in some way, right? Uh, as we've seen members begin to ask questions during the oversight process, uh, you know, about how their um, specific agencies uh, are designing programs and tracking, uh, you know, outcomes uh, along race. And so by rule, and, and, you know, this is being completely transparent, by rule, there is, uh, we are not required to conduct a RIA for the Local Budget Act or the Budget Support Act. Um, however, we are going to be work, continuing to work with members and staff to ensure that uh, a racial equity lens um, is applied to, to the budget. I mean, you know, the budget is where the rubber meets the road, right? And so if we are not able to apply racial equity lens to the budget, um, you know, it is likely that these inequities will continue to revolve. And so when we talk about operationalizing racial equity, we're really talking about incorporating racial equity into every step uh, of the legislative process, and that includes budget. So, you know, it, we are open to ideas and it's something we'll be continuing to work with members to, um, you know, make sure it's, it's, it's prioritized. Um, how will your work impact existing policy? Well, we already covered that one. Um, recently, President Biden has committed to advancing racial equity and supporting underserved communities and embedding racial equity in his administration's response to COVID and the economic how do you think the Biden administration's efforts align and impact um, what's happening here at the local level uh, and maybe specifically with your office? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're seeing that this is a national conversation that's taking place. Um, and so it's a much welcomed uh, change of pace than the, uh, the prior administration. And so we are seeing uh, an overwhelming response of community organizations, boards and commissions, the private sector, uh, beginning to commit to real transformative change uh, as it relates to racial equity and having it come down from the feds uh, is, is, is informative. One of the things that was included in that policy is that they are requiring uh, each agency head to evaluate how data is collected and to devise a plan of how their specific agencies will advance racial equity. Well, I'm proud to say the racial equity achieves resource legislation already does that. So, um, you know, in that sense, the district is making leaps and bounds. And I'll also just say like more generally speaking, um, you know, there are many uh, local jurisdictions that are advancing this work um, who we are in touch with, um, who we, re we rely on each other, we vent to each other, we learn best practices from each other. And so those are our friends at Montgomery County, our friends at Tacoma Park, Charles County, um, Alexandria, Arlington. This is a nationwide movement. Um, and so, you know, everyone is, is getting on board, which doesn't make it easy. Um, doesn't mean everyone's committed to it, but it is a strong signal. So two things, you actually answered the question. One of the questions that I had was, did you all design the office by looking at other jurisdictions and efforts that they were doing, you, you partly answered that. Uh, Juanita Britton, who is one of our, um, lead, who is one of our resident leaders, uh, uh, and you knew once you came into uh, our living room, 
uh, that this would personalize, wants to know, are you gonna be attending the tenant association per uh, an invite that you have received? And so if you haven't seen that invite, I'll make sure that we connect Juanita uh, and her invite uh, to you, Brian, for your consideration. Does it ring a bell? Is it, is it on your radar screen? Oh yeah, if you send it to me, I'll definitely take a look. So thanks for raising that up. Okay. Um, so we are right about the end. Brian, I wanna give you an opportunity. And first of all, just let me thank you. We, we, we had a, a really healthy um, sign up list. Um, one of the things that we do in our new remote existence is we predict how much drop off we get it, for each meeting. I mean, you know, it's one thing when you write a check and, and to, you know, to attend something, and, you know, you make a point to go, but in our new remote existence, people sign up for stuff and then other things grab them. But there has been very little drop off between the people who signed up and the people who actually showed up, which I think is a demonstration of interest in what you're doing. So I just wanted to note that and thank you CNAGD family uh, for turning out. It's important in moments like this when the city is taking these kinds of turns um, to deepen on the governmental side in particular, its, it's role in recognizing its authority and its obligation um, that we support. So turning out for this uh, is, is a supporting, is, is, is important. Um, and also I just, you know, so Brian, I, I wanna thank you for um, being here, but also just thank you for your leadership and your commitment. Um, I want you to view the entire CNHED family as a resource. Um, we you know, always say closest to the problem, closest to the solution. And our members, as you well know, are right in the trenches. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're not only addressing the issues, they're feeling the impacts. And I think that they offer an interpretive resource in your work. Like, what does it look like to get new development right? What does bad development look like when it happens wrong? Um, I think they can give you both kind of, they can contribute to both measures. So view us as a resource. You know that Yvette and the team at CNHED and me, you know, we got your back and we're gonna figure out ways. But I think that the network as a whole is a really rich resource um, to you. So um, we're here for you. We are, we're, we're cheering you on. We will work for you to try to help you succeed in every way you can. But I'd just like to invite you to make any closing remarks you wanna make. Yeah, so Steve, thank you again for the invitation and thank the entire team at CNHED. I mean, you know, I just want to underscore the point that you said, like this is going to take uh, all hands on deck to advance racial equity for, uh, for the District of Columbia. Um, and CORE, we are here to be innovative and to think outside the box. And so, you know, I want to be able to hear uh, any and every solution uh, and proposal that you all have uh, you know, we may say that like, hey, maybe this won't work or maybe let's tweak it this way. Uh, but I want you all to know that we are available in our door. Our virtual door <laughs> is open to you all. So thanks again. All right. Thank you so much. Um, CNHED family, we are, um, I think, I think next up, Hallie, is it going to be the budget briefing? Even though we may be moving dates. <laughs> um, I think next up will be our annual budget briefing. Uh, we just found out that the mayor may change the release of her budget. Holly will be coordinating that. Um, we have already gotten confirmations both on the housing and the economic development side for um, the regular lineup um, um, that we, we have. The deputy mayor has confirmed, director of housing has confirmed, a housing authority director has confirmed. Uh, on the economic development side, we have confirmations um, as well. And we're still getting them, so it should be a it, it, it should be two robust budget briefings. We're going to have one on housing and another one on um, on our economic development cluster issues. So uh, thanks again, Brian. We look forward to working with you. Thanks, CNHED, for turning out. It's been a great meeting. We appreciate everybody.